What's up, it's Nez, and hello everyone, welcome back to the letter. Last episode, we had a run-in with Luke and Kylie, and unfortunately accuse him of being some sort of kidnapper. But we also had our own run-in with Isabella on our way home. And it seems like she's finally up to the task of investigating the fucking mansion. The brief lull the past two days has offered is nice while it lasted. Or as nice as it can get with worries of Isabella's whereabouts creeping up to me every now and then. She hasn't shown up after that last talk we had in the hallway, and the dinner I've brought had since been given to a different neighbor before it spoils. By all means, this shouldn't be anything to lose sleep over. She's gone on work trips before, usually a day or two. This might simply be one of those. Or maybe she's finally investigating the mansion with Ash and Zack. Although it's often a message saying exactly where. But it's the door note she has ended our last chat with that gnaws. Like an ugly premonition. And as expected, just as things start to settle and a steady rhythm finally worms its way back to my routine, Thursday mornings bring further disturbance to the now calm waters. With little ceremony, though still enough to ripple through everything. In retrospect, I really should have seen this coming. Oh no. Luxborn is a small city, relatively speaking. Compared to, say, London or Glasgow, it's nothing but a tiny mass of land boasting a mere population of 68,000. But those numbers alone are nothing to scoff at when standing in a busy street. And if you pay close enough attention, faces taking the crosswalk or riding the subway will soon grow familiar. How unfortunate that out of that number it has to be Tio fucking Luke I encounter more than once. Oh, you know, a few problems popping up here and there that the agents failed to tell us somehow. I think a few hired hands can't fix, of course. I would have preferred a place near the city and something that's new to save us all the trouble. But darling wife insisted. Ah, who am I to say no? Hi there, Luke. What are you doing in this school? Ah, oh, are you kidding me? His smug head is the first thing I see upon turning into the hall, in spite of the small crowd of parents and students gathered at the corridor for the primary's career day. It's not that he stands out, he's pretty unremarkable at first glance, frankly. However, it's his continence that draws people's eyes to him. The manner he carries himself with all the confidence in the world, his mere presence dwarfing everything around him. I'm willing to make a bet he's also enjoying the attention it garners him, especially the ones coming from the women. What an ass. A single glance at him and I know immediately that one way or another, if we ever bump into each other again, my day will effectively be ruined in some capacity. He also exudes that air. The sort that makes you want to run him over with a lorry and pass it off as an unfortunate accident. With him, it's either you want to punch him or let yourself be charmed. There's no in-between. I'll gladly do the honor of the former myself, but alas, there are people around us. Oh, come on, Rebecca. Now I'm stuck with having to face one of the two. I shouldn't have volunteered. At the time, helping out sounded like a good idea. I've no classes left today until after lunch. I could have opted to stay at the teacher's lounge and work on my lesson plans, but that means being left alone with her deputy head and his chatter. He's a good man, but Crivens he can talk anyone's ears off. So the moment an opportunity rose, I jumped on it. It's a simple task to boot. Just deliver a whole box of materials and a few posters for the event. Maybe stay around to assist if time will allow it. I just wasn't expecting him to show up here. Out of the frying pan and into the fire. Had I known, I would have stayed and suffered through the deputy's impromptu speeches about his life crisis instead. But what's done is done. Going back is also out of the question. With how unexpectedly heavy the load I'm carrying is, I'd hate to lug this for a trip back just because my pride can't take another second of interaction with that guy. He's insufferable, alright, but I've had my fair share of dealings with teens of, more or less, the same temperament, all considerably younger than him, and they listened. If he wants to be difficult like last time, so be it, but he can bet his sorry English ass I'm not standing down. Left with no other choice, I brace myself and suck in a breath, mustering every patience I have as I step into the hall. My grip on the box tightens when I pull it closer to me, and attempt to assume a low-key air as I amble towards the room. The box is not big enough to hide my face even with the stuff piled on top, but if all else fails I can just hit him with it. Still a small prayer forms in my head. If there's even one listening out there, please grant me enough restraint. Better yet, I hope he doesn't notice me at all. That'll definitely make my life easier. Seriously, how hard can it be? He's standing a few ways from the door and there are plenty of people between us to use for cover. If I'm careful, I can just go in, hand in the stupid box to whoever's in charge, forget every plan of staying longer than necessary, and step out as soon as I can. Easy as pie! But as luck would have it, in the exact moment I reach the room's threshold, something, someone, barrels towards me. 
She latches onto my waist before topping the sudden commotion with a gleeful squeal. I knew it's you! Hi there, Kylie. The force of it nearly throws me off balance, sending the items stacked atop the box tilting dangerously to the sides. With the child's added weight at my waist pinning me on the spot and both of my hands occupied, watching is the only thing I'm able to do. The short seconds in between slows as everything gradually slides off the box's small surface. Under different circumstances, this would have made for a funny story some other time. Comical even. Until another set of hands reaches out and steadies the posters threatening to take a nosedive right to the floor. Careful now, Daisy, don't make a mess here. Oh, fucking Luke. My entire body freezes. Upon hearing his voice alone, an irrational impulse to hit him immediately bubbles up. But before my limbs could catch up with what my brain is currently screaming at me, he moves to take the burden off my arms. Irritation gives way to surprise, then confusion. It is in that moment when instinct finally kicks in and I tug the box closer to me, before he can fully lift it off. What are you doing? What are you doing, Luke? What does it look like? You're surprisingly slow on the uptake with someone of your profession, aren't you? Uh, bloody, doesn't this girl have people for this kind of work? <laughs> So much for being a center of academic excellence. I'm going to ignore that slight to my alma mater and my work, because that's not what I'm trying to get at. You know what? Why don't we just rephrase that to something you'll easily understand? Why exactly are you doing this? Yes, Luke, why? Well, you look like you could use a bit of help. Luke, wanting to help people? Have you seen your face while you were heaving this around? Mister? I'm pretty sure if there's ever a look on my face, it's entirely because I saw something extremely unpleasant this morning. <laughs> aren't you a ball of sunshine today, Daisy? Having a bad day, aren't we? Oh, you have no idea. I'd put it away if I were you. You might scare the children. You don't have to worry about that. This isn't my department. I was just asked to bring these. Anyway, I can handle this myself, mister. The room's just right over there. Behind you, in fact. Now, if you could please move over and make way, it would do the whole world some good. Yes, Luke, it would do the whole world some good. Keeping my voice level throughout is a miracle in itself, but regardless of how polite my request is, he doesn't budge. Did what I've just said merely flew over his head? Were my choice of words really that difficult to comprehend? Surely it shouldn't be that hard. I think he might be a little touched in the head. I'd like to ask him that, actually, but Kylie chooses that instant to pipe in. Don't worry, Miss Pink. Theo's strong. You can leave this to him. My papa does it lots of times, but I'm not allowed to talk about it to anyone. Theo says it's conf... Confid... <laughs> Confidential, Munchkin. That's right. Theo's smart, isn't he, Miss Pink? Oh yes, Luke is very smart. I'm still of the opinion that he's a piece of shite, but I must admit, his goddaughter's excitement is contagious as always. A smile makes its way to my lips. She has yet to budge from her place, though to be honest, I'm starting to lose some feeling on my stomach with how tightly she's wound her arms around it. I'm sure he is, Kylie. But I'm also sure he'll find better use for it elsewhere. Like helping you out! Oh well, that's one thing, but... <laughs> you heard the kid. Fuck. No one's asking you. You wound me, woman. And I'm quite certain I can do more damage than that. Shall we give it a try? Again? He pales, stammers for a bit until he ultimately decides against saying anything and settles for a brief show of discomfort instead. He's probably having flashbacks of the last time we met. His composure when he finally regains some of his bearings says it all. It's nothing short of hilarious if I do say so myself. I I'll have you know that threats never work on me, Daisy. Not in a million years, not ever. You're assuming it's a threat. How cute. But th that too, I'm not scared of you. Just because you landed a hit. Uh -huh. Do go on, keep telling yourself that. And we would have landed more. It was a fluke, you hear. I was caught off guard and your damn book left a dent. If I end up in a hospital because of what you did, I'm sending the chief of Luxburg police after you, woman. You don't say. Just give me that bloody box. He snatches it out of my arms before a single word of protest exits my mouth and quickly disappears behind the classroom. Not that it matters who brings it in now, my prior irritation has already melted into amusement. He's not so bad once you figure out how his temperament works, it's almost similar to a child. 
though I still have to ask. Kylie, did your Tio eat something bad before coming here? He's unusually nice today. A far-fetched idea, I know, but it's the only reason I can think of why this asshole is suddenly acting like a decent human he's quite frankly far from being. First and foremost, we didn't end our last meeting on a good note. If I were him, I'd avoid the very person who put a dent on his skull, as he so aptly put it. Why is he acting friendly two days after? He always is! But I made him promise to be extra nice to you, since you helped me so much. Aw, thank you, Kylie. I think you're gonna be great friends! I don't think so. I quickly stomp on the urge to groan loudly or gag at that. He's the last person I'd ever want to be chummy with in this whole city, but Kylie doesn't need to know that. Are you sure it's not something he ate during breakfast? I gave him some jelly babies this morning. Maybe that was it. Really brought me lots of them. Mama said I should share, so I offered half of it to Tia when he picked me up. He likes the black ones. Of course he does. Oh, that's probably why he's weird. Jelly baby overdose. He could have done everyone a favor and choked on them while he was at it. Do you want some? I've got more! I can't play Melody or Takako this morning, uh, but I'm sure it'll be fine sharing some of it with you. Okay, I'm still very suspicious of your imaginary friend Takako. No, I'm not really very fond of them. I was just asking. Oh, where's your mom, by the way? Out of town with Papa. An unexpected pang hits me at her words. The statement, though innocent enough, unearths a whole trunk of memories from childhood. So eerily familiar. Nights spent eating dinners alone, the number of days coming home to an empty house growing with each passing year, and sometimes several Christmas Eves spent with relatives instead of my own family. It's too late to think about it now, but when I remember, the dull ache is still there, familiar though lessened by the years now. Beside me, Kylie takes a step back. Having gotten tired of clinging to me, there's nothing but cheer in her, she doesn't seem too affected by the fact. Although it makes me wonder how much of it is real, and how much of it is there to mask the loneliness if there's even one. What a lucky child. Weren't they informed of career day beforehand? Yeah, I told them all about it. Mama was looking forward to it. And they still left? Uh-huh. It's important business, so it can't be helped. They promised to tell me about it when they come back tomorrow, though. But Pa said he'll give me a gift if I behave. I've been a good girl, right, Miss Pink? Oh yes, you've been a good girl. Aside from that time you turned into a fucking creepy ghost in front of Zack. You always are. But they asked that douche, I mean, they asked your Tio to look after you? For this? Nope, they didn't. No? Then how? It was supposed to be Tia. Mama likes her better than Tio, so she asked her, but she's sick and had to visit the doctor today. Wait, why is Hannah sick? Oh, that's supposed to be a secret, by the way. Oh, but I think it's a bit confusing because Tio said she also went shopping. That's unfair. Don't you think so, Miss Pink? My mom doesn't allow me to go out when I'm sick. It's still okay, though, since Tio always buys me sweets before we go home. I'm gonna ask for a parfait today. Extra large. Don't tell Takako, okay? Oh no, we're not gonna tell Takako. Just tell her not to kill us, okay? Listening to her like this, it's easy to get a picture of where Kylie's fondness for the guy comes from. His money. She's far from a demanding child, unless you've made a promise of some sort. She never forgets those. She'll make friends with anyone wherever she is. Buy her a few things and Viola, you're settled. No wonder she's so attached to the man. The douche probably showers her with gifts whenever he can. I can't say the sentiments, the same for the latter, however. He doesn't seem the type and probably just does it for the sake of getting some peace and quiet whenever he's with the girl. Classic techniques. But before that, I'm gonna show him to everyone first. It's gonna be great! No one else has a gazillionaire fairy godfather. Also, also, when I grow up, I'm gonna be exactly like him and marry someone really handsome. Like Tia did! That way, I can be awesome too! Ah, uh, please don't grow up to be like Luke. There's some sort of misguided logic in there that I'd like to correct. But before I can say my piece, Douchebag steps in, fresh out of the commotion from the classroom behind us, and plows into the conversation with every subtlety of a wrecking ball has. No shite given despite no one asking for his opinion. Munchkin, sweetie, trust me. You don't have to marry someone for that to happen. I don't? <laughs> Just do your thing, darling. I'm quite sure you can do great things on your own without lugging around an extra baggage with you. Tia married you. What? Where are we getting here? Kylie drops the statement without any sort of preface. And the moment it lands, the douche finds himself grappling with the conversation. Yeah, I, well, that's... 
that's true, Munchkin, technically. But it's not the same thing. I'm sure it's not the same thing, Luke. A small frown creases the girl's eyebrows as she tries to comprehend her Tio's rather vague explanation. It's not surprising either when Luke tenses under the child's questioning gaze. It's familiar. I've seen the same look a great deal of times before, on Ashton whenever he's trying to say something he can't quite phrase. Another second passes before the douche moves, kneeling in front of Kylie and placing both his hands on either side of her shoulder. Kind is the last word I'll ever use to describe the man, but in this minute, there's a smile on his face I can't place, tender by all means for someone as obnoxious as him. It's a curious thing to see, if not a bit odd. Listen here, sweetie, Tia. Tia was already a great person before she met me. She is? But I don't see her doing anything. She's always at home. Not always, Munchkin. Did you know she's really good at numbers? Luke, you actually remember that? You're good with them too. You helped me with my homework once. Well, Tia's much, much better than me. She used to do maths with big numbers. Oh, like millions? <gasps> no, gazillions. And she's really, really good at it. So much so that her dad let her manage anything that had to do with it. Why is Luke being so kind right now? But then again, he is talking about Hannah, our blonde waifu who wouldn't be in love with her. That was even before she met me, too. Does that mean she's better than you? Oh, leagues, Munchkin. Way, way better than I'll ever be. What was that? For some reason, I don't think he's still talking about his wife's mathematical prowess as his voice trails off. In fact, if I have not been paying closer attention, I wouldn't have noticed a change in him. A slight shift in his smile from one that's tender to something wistful, like remembering a memory he has always been fond of, but has often kept to himself. And at the fleeting glance of it, a tiny insignificant part of the world somehow also shifts. Opinions changing, impressions moving. You know what, why don't you ask Tia next time you have homework, hmm? Okay, next time I'll ask her to help out. See, no need to marry a good-for-nothing bloke. Can I also tell her to not stay at home anymore? Please do not stay at home in that mansion. If Tia's good at it, I'm sure she can help you out too. Uh, I'm Papa. He computes a lot of numbers too. Tia can help him. <laughs> you go do that. I'm sure she'll love to hear it, Munchkin. Even if it's been a while since. Another silence from him, then without missing a beat, he turns Kylie around and lightly pats her shoulder, in a gesture to end their conversation right here and there. Probably before he can say other things he's never intended to say or a child is not meant to hear. But off you go first. I think I saw your friend run off to the other classroom. The one with the pigtails? Go say hi to her. You still have those jelly babies to give her, yes? Alright! But wait for me, okay? I've got loads more to show you. They put up my drawing on the bulletin the other day. I'm gonna take you there later. I'll be back! She soon disappears behind the small crowd, none the wiser to the sudden change in mood around her. Luke straightens as soon as she's gone, the expression on his face grows less kind now that there's no one to reassure. <laughs> Despite that, a chuckle still escapes me. His head quickly snaps at me, an accusing glare clear in his eyes. Although it's less threatening now, considering what I've witnessed earlier. Funny how one person's impression of someone can easily change with that minute detail. Why are you laughing like that? <laughs> Don't mind me. I just saw something surprising today. Don't let it bother you. You know, putting it like that won't make me any less inclined to ask. He's still gonna hit on you, you know. What is it, woman? If this is another one of your threats, I've already told you it isn't going to work on me. That good teacher act isn't going to fool anyone. What makes you think it has to do with you? I could have just remembered something funny. Not everything in this world revolves around you, mister. I am not daft, Daisy. It's on your face for all the world to see. Now, say it so we can be done with this stupid talk. Are we gonna lay it on him? <laughs> I let out another laugh. More to delay than to express any sort of amusement over the matter. In truth, I don't know where to start. One wrong move, one wrong chord, and I might offend the man. You're good at handling her. You really think that? He's childish enough for that, even if what I'm about to say are just mere honest observations. You really think that? You really think that? It's an honest question. Because no matter how much I turn it around inside my head, the gap between the man standing in front of me and the idea I have of him just won't connect. Not that the gesture will go a long way with him. Something in his demeanor tells me he's definitely not the kind of man who readily accepts such when they are given to him. 
Rather, he feels entitled to it from the get-go. So long as you're standing in front of him, he expects it to be there, demands for it when he cannot see it in you. And after all those insults we've hurled at each other, I don't think it'll matter much to him if I point out the ugly truths or brandish it in his face. As expected, it doesn't throw him off in the least, and he merely raises a questioning brow at me. About what? About what you told Kylie. And don't you think she's a bit too young for that kind of talk? Kylie's six, Daisy, not an infant who still needs help changing her nappy. At her age, she can already handle more than that. Besides, it's better to nip this whole thing at the butt. You know, before she starts thinking that a man's ego defines her self-worth. Well, we seem to be hitting something here. I certainly don't need someone else to define me. Why should any god out of mine do? So, do I really think that? Yes. Yes, very much so. Why shouldn't I? All right, I get it. I'm sorry. You just didn't seem the type to me. I've intended to end the conversation right there and simply go my way. I no longer have any business here and our deputy principal's stories sound much more enticing the longer I stand here. With the manner Luke's almost ranting, I have a feeling this won't end if I say more. Though thinking about it, I should have left the second he has taken the box from me. Naturally, he doesn't get the hint. The type. And what, pray tell, would my type be according to your standards, woman? The sort I'd happily bury alive. Well, would you look at what's coming out of those pretty little lips? Watch the language, Daisy. You're supposed to be teaching children. What would ever happen to this nation? You know what I mean. Oh, and you somehow find that tidbit funny. A little, I admit. That sort of wisdom is the last thing I expected to come from you. I mean, look at yourself. Pampered and pompous to the last hair. You've probably never been to this side of Luxbourne until a few days ago. <sighs> Daisy, just because I'm dressed miles better than the average bloke you see every day, doesn't mean I'm incapable of thinking on your level. Actually, I'm more surprised we aren't on the same page on this. I expected better from someone with enough balls to hit a random stranger with a bloody book. In public, mind you. Someone my goddaughter looks up to, even. Guess you can't have everything in this world, hmm. Well, I... of course I'm... Oh, <laughs> I get it. Running on presupposed notions, aren't we? My, my, what a dangerous thing to practice for a teacher. You know what, I can't believe this, but I'm on Luke's side on this one. It doesn't have anything to do with... What is it this time, I wonder? Oh, I don't say it, let me guess. What do those random gossips in this bloody city usually say? Oh, right! You probably think I'd go with clingy, spoiled kind, didn't you? What? Where did that... How did you even come to that conclusion? Oh, don't lie to me now, Daisy. But just so we're clear, if I wanted an arm decor, I'd have gone with the first brainless mantra I picked up on the streets. I have standards, you know. I haven't even said a word! I was just asking what you thought of it! Oh, but you were thinking about it or else you wouldn't have asked. <laughs> Might as well get it out of the way, hmm? Ugh, you are impossible! <laughs> so they say. Tell me something I didn't know, Daisy. You... you... Ugh, I really have no idea how anyone with half a brain can put up with you! We have no idea with Hannah either. Let me speak with your wife sometime. I'd love to ask her. That last remark just came out. There might be a sliver of truth in it, but I shouldn't have phrased it like that. Even for my own standards or the kind of person I'm talking to, it's still quite rude. An apology is already at my throat, but the minute I open my mouth, all of what I prepared myself to say dissipates. Lost in the moment in front of me. He has turned gaze outside, staring at some point past the buildings blocking the view of the sky, equally lost in his thoughts. He's a vexing man under so many standards, however in this moment, in the morning light streaming from the window lends his features a certain air. Softer less severe than what he often flaunts. I might as well be looking at a different man. There's a tender note in his voice when he finds it, the words muttered under his breath not intended for anyone but himself. Nevertheless, it reaches my ears, unintentional as it may be. You're right. She deserves someone far better than me. Are you far? What? 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 what huh? What? Luke? Luke? Is this a Luke that we know? All that talk about self-worth makes some sense now. It isn't some profound knowledge he pulled out of his ass, it has come about because he's already been there, likely still stuck in the middle of it. Reaching about your own personal experience is easier after all. Less room for mistakes, more of a dose of self-loathing. What a complicated man. 
Just when you thought you've already figured him out, he does one thing and says the other. People like him are the most difficult to gauge, far harder to understand. Yet it might be exactly for this reason why some are so easily charmed by him. It's the mystery that catches them, of wanting to find out what's underneath that bravado. I won't count myself among those, yet his winning personality isn't exactly my cup of tea. But sometimes, once you get a glimpse of what's beyond that machismo, empathizing with a man isn't such a steep hill to climb. If the comfortable silence we now share tells anything, that is. Perhaps this is as close as a friendship as we can get, several insults flung around with a few shared silences in between, and... That's not exactly a bad thing. He's not exactly a bad guy either, despite the awkward start we've had. Maybe it's for this reason that I can't resist throwing in a little comment to lift his mood before leaving him. You know, Luke, you're not such a bad person. Is that supposed to make me feel better? <clears throat> I'm touched, Daisy. Take it how you will, but a little attitude change would help. A lot. It would, Luke. Ah, oh, bollocks. Right, of course. Let me know when you're done with your lecture, ma'am. And you can probably start by not leaving your wife out while you're having some quality time with your goddaughter. Who knows? Maybe that'll help change how the child sees her. Where did you even get the idea I'm leaving my wife out? Have you ever even met? Actually, we have. No, but I did see her with you two last time. His indifferent expression quickly dissolves into a confused scowl while I meet it with matching perplexity. It has only been two days. Surely his memory isn't that bad. What? What was this? At the cafe. After you left. Oh, fuck, you mean her? She was sitting right beside you. Kylie was at the back and you were driving. Daisy, are you sure you haven't accidentally hit yourself with your own book? Because that damn thing's quite thick. And I'm really getting worried about you. That wasn't Hannah. It has only been a few days and concussions can be dangerous. I suggest you have that checked. Well, you asked. I just answered. It's pretty rude to make her wait like that, by the way. How can I make her wait when she's not even with us? What? It was just Kylie and I that night. <laughs> now you're just pulling my leg. Nope, he wasn't, Rebecca. Luke <sighs> exhales long and drawn out, his impatience rapidly changing the companionable air around us. In the face of it, I tense. I've accidentally stepped on another minefield. Any chat I've had with him so far has been like this. Why this still surprises me escapes me, but above my worries of offending the man is my own bewilderment. I remember well enough what I saw that night, yet he says something completely different. Wifey was out with Kylie's mummy that night. She wasn't with us. How do you think I ended up on babysitting duty? But... It, in the front seat. And Kylie's... <coughs> Miss Big! Kylie, what happened? Kylie's sobs reach my ears first and then her familiar weight returns around my waist again. Hot tears seep through my blouse as she buries her face in it, her arms winding tightly around me. Luke and I briefly exchange worried glances, his own lips shut tight with concern. Her cries are soft enough not to attract much attention, most of the visitors have been ushered inside the rooms by now anyway. Those that still linger though watches our little group with great interest and concern. If I don't get a better handle of the situation, I have a feeling Luke will start yelling at everyone soon. Kneeling, I gently pull the girl away from me, cupping her face and wiping away tears creating little trails on her cheeks. Her mouth is drawn in a miserable pout when she peers up to me. All right, Kylie. Calm down. What happened? <laughs> it's my friend! Takako? That's a little too vague, Munchkin. Let her speak, Luke. Who is it, Kylie? Melody? Or was it the other one? Yeah. Fuck! Did the two of you fight? She nods and immediately clams up after, letting her sobs communicate the story instead, or as much as her shaking shoulders can tell me. Right behind me, Luke gives a nervous huff. While he shifts on his feet, he must not be used to handling children crying. What a wuss. Sweetie, I won't be able to help you if you don't tell me what happened. Seconds pass before she responds again. The tears are already gone when she finally musters the strength to talk, her cries subsiding to mere sniffles. I wanted to give her the rest of the jelly babies, but she won't come out. Where? Where is she? Don't tell me she's in the lockers. Oh, fuck. Is she still there? Another nod. She won't say what's wrong. I kept asking her, but she told me to go away. Career day is going to start soon. I saw the price and Miss Alice will give us it for good. She's going to miss it. Is that what you told her? Yeah. She won't listen. She won't even take the jelly babies. After I saved it for her, too. Don't tell me she also likes the black ones. She and Luke wanted to eat the red ones, but I told him it's not for him. 
Oh, she wants the red ones. Miss Pink, can you talk to her? Tell her to come out, and I'm really upset with her. Ah, uh, just a little childish argument then. Times like this, I'm glad I teach teenagers mature enough for petty squabbles. I do love being around children and won't mind having one or two of my own in the future, but it takes a whole different level of patience to teach several of them. I honestly admire my colleagues who willingly took the challenge. Normally I'll leave this for their homeroom teachers to fix, but I can't just ignore the imploring look she shoots me. That's another weakness I'll have to steel myself against before I ever think of having one of my own. For now I give in to it. Okay. Tell me where she is, sweetie. Oh no. Sighing, I stand up and gesture for her to lead the way. Luke trails quietly behind us. Even with a small distance in between, his apprehensions palpable, understandably so. No one wants to be caught in the middle of a children's spat. But in the end, this is all part of my job. I can't just shy away from it, can I? Oh god. Kylie escorts us to the adjacent hall. At this hour, the corridors and the rooms lining its sides are empty. Save for the gentle rustling of leaves, the twittering birds outside, the tapping of our foot against the floor, the whole area stays eerily quiet. Not unusual, though. This is the part of the building reserved for club activities at the end of the school day, and with the rest of the school busy with another event, it's only natural for this to be deserted. Come afternoon, right after class, it'll once again be filled with people. For the time being, I focus on the toilets at the far end, heading straight for it. Luke stays behind, opting to wait for the end of this drama instead, obviously not wanting to deal with another person's kid. Meanwhile, Kylie follows right after me, unusually silent as we approach the ladies' room. Sometime before we made the turn to this hallway, she has stopped sniffling and started singing a tune under her breath. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge Probably to brace or calm herself, down, or maybe this is her way of preparing to pull her friend out of her sulk. It certainly reminds me of another person. I make no remarks of it, however. It's all part of growing up, they say. Let her learn. The door is slightly ajar when we get to it, and from inside, the sobs of a girl echo weakly, barely audible even in this kind of hush. Oh, I know those sobs. Turns out, Kylie's not the only one upset about this. Despite the situation, a smile forms in my lips as I call out to her friend. Hello? Hello there? You're Kylie's friend, aren't you? Uh, Melody, is it? She's looking for you. That's not Melody. Children can be so amusing sometimes. Granted, they can be exasperating, especially around this age, but the endearing things about them outweigh those. All you need is enough patience. Career day is about to start, too. You'll have to come out, or you're going to be really late for it. Miss Alice won't be happy if one of her kids isn't there. I heard she brought little gifts for everyone who'll behave. Don't you want to receive one? However, her cries show no signs of abating. They only grow louder. Not close to a wail. Alarming, regardless. Um, are you okay? From where I'm standing, it sounds almost like she's in some kind of pain, and it's not impossible. They do that at times, hiding what ails them for the fear of a reprimand. If it's like that, coaxing her out might be useless. It also makes sense why she chose the loo furthest from the classroom. Wasting no time, I gesture for Kylie to wait and amble towards the door, calmly so I don't alarm her. At the same time, a distinct sense of deja vu hits me. I've been in this position before, behind the door, with someone crying on the other side, my calls ignored as their cries grow into a wail. Just this past week, actually. Even so, being in the same situation before doesn't bring any comfort. And putting up for the child beside me is a thick undercurrent of worrying trickling into my stomach. I take one last breath, then I nudge open the door. It all happens in the span of a second. I don't make it past two steps into the room. Her cries abruptly stop. Light footsteps shuffle behind me, coming to a halt at the door. My heart skips a beat. And when I turn... Kylie? Fuck! Miss Pink? Miss Pink? Why didn't you help her? My whole body becomes motionless at the sight of her, words catching in my throat and my heart pounding rapidly against my chest. This is Kylie, I'm sure of it. Yet nothing in the manner she speaks or the way she tilts her head in question carries the youthful innocent vibe she always brings with her. As if I'm merely looking at a dead hollow imitation of a child. Can't you hear her? She's asking for your help. Oh, Kylie! But it's not those that trigger a memory. It's those chilling eyes. Falling. Beckoning. Why won't you listen to her? All at once the memory returns to me. 
A tide that has receded and now returns to shore with an overwhelming force, carrying images of a single moment from days ago. Of a world passing by in a blur and of features I can barely discern under the little light there was. Not even a week has passed. In this minute, while I keep my eyes trained on the child before me, they return with such unbearable clarity. There was no horrid wounds this time, no blood streaming down a pale face, thank heavens. Just lips contorted into a small, twisted smile. They brim with venom I've never expected to see on a child, sending tiny pinpricks of dread crawling up my limbs and winding up my neck. You're a bad person. People like you deserve to die. I can't breathe. <laughs> Those whispers and laughters again. Judging. Mocking. Taunting. Each scathing word ringing sharp and true against my ears. My throat closes in. My whole body tenses. The chill settles at the tip of my fingertips, every digit gone rigid from the cold. With every single draw of breath, any struggle for air or freedom, the coils wrapped around my body tight and dragging me down. A gradual torturous descent into another bottomless abyss. <coughs> Rebecca! On. And on. And on. Until I lose touch with myself and the world. <coughs> Luke, I can't believe I'm saying this, but you gotta go in and help her. Until darkness claims me and... Unexpectedly, a note. In the distance, harsh and piercing, cutting through the thick stupor and shattering the haze without warning. Are you ladies done with your business here? I have a morning to wait for you two. Come on, Luke, come in. <gasps> My eyes snap open and the world shifts into place with a ragged gasp. When I glance up, a different set of eyes greet me. Are you okay, Miss Pink? Hi, Kylie. No anger. No vile hatred in them. Just plain, sincere concern. Bit by bit, I become aware of my surroundings and myself as warmth steadily slips back into me. I've reached out for the nearby counter to steady myself at some point, and my knuckles have gone white from how rigid my grip on it was. It's over now, yet the tension hasn't left my body. My heart still hammers hard against my chest in an erratic rhythm, and my breathing still comes in short, shallow bursts. Before me, Kylie fumbles with her hands, utterly unsure of what to do, an adult in what's probably a laughable state. Did you get sick? Uh, I'll call Tia, okay? No need. Just... just leave me alone. Do you know how to fix you? Oh wait, okay? Don't leave us alone. Oh wait, no. I... I have no idea. Leave us alone? Not leave us alone? I wish I can speak reassurances to her, but I can't shake it off. The dread is there, twisting at my insides in anticipation. Of what? I'm no longer sure. Pushing myself off the counter, I break into a run. Brushing off the anxious look Kylie gives me when I gently push her away on my way out, or the furrow in Luke's brows when I stumble into him outside. Whatever they both saw in my face, I care not to know. Bloody hell, I don't even understand what's happening anymore. Well, 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 Rebecca, it seems that you're also getting your dose of hauntings too. Let's see how much more you could take before starting to believe in the ghost. But until then, my name is Nez and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode of The Letter, like and subscribe so we could grow our channel together. See you all next time, everyone. Bye!